Well, good morning, church. Would you stand with us as we begin this morning of worship and reflection? Um, have you ever wondered why the day Jesus died is called good? It's because Sunday is coming. The team and I are going to teach you a new song this morning. Would you worship with us as you are able, as the songs come to you, just worship the Lord. dawns in Galilee Some say madam and some say king A wonder working rebel priest Jesus Christ the Nazarene He knew well what it would take all from sin and grief a perfect man would have to die and only he could pay that price and Friday's good cause Sunday's coming and don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming Devil, you're done, you better start running. The Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming. So he let the soldiers take him in. As his friend betrayed him with a kiss. There before the mocking crowd Like a lamb to the sun it didn't make a sound Then he carried that cross to Calvary Then he shed his blood to set us free As the nails sings to him alone 
We watch and wait like a bride for a groom. Oh, church, arise, he is coming soon. Powerful lyrics, you know, Friday's good. Why? Because Sunday is coming. And so don't lose hope, right? TGIF, thank God that it's Friday. Because if, it, if there weren't, in order to be a resurrection, there needed to be a death, right? And so today we're here to celebrate and reflect on the death of Christ, part of the Easter weekend story. Go ahead and grab a seat. Um, and uh, don't get too comfortable because I'm going to get you back up in a couple minutes here. But I do want to welcome you to our annual Good Friday service today. And you know, I was thinking that we live in a culture where there's often symbols that we identify with certain things. Like recently, you know, if you saw, you know, a clover leaf, you immediately think, oh yeah, you know, St. Patrick's Day. And um, uh, uh, if, uh, for example, you know, uh, with Valentine's Day, you, you know, you see the Cupid and the heart and you kind of readily identify with that. Um, I remember uh, several years ago, different times I've been in different places around the world, often on mission trips. I was heading to Indonesia a number of years ago, and we had an overnighter on the way in Malaysia. So we were kind of in a strange city, hadn't been there before, and looked outside our, our motel window, and just around the corner, we saw some golden arches. <laughs> so we knew exactly, billion served, right? And you see, you know, you see those, the, the golden arches, and immediately you identify um, with McDonald's. Well, you know, of all the different symbols that our faith um, could have been remembered by, the most powerful and enduring symbol is the symbol of the cross. Um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, it could have been a towel because Jesus washed the disciples' feet and he modeled servant leadership. Maybe, you know, it could have been a boat because Jesus spent a lot of time on boats and, and uh, things like that. Could have been like a crib or a manger or a carpenter's bench or any of those things we think of the life of Jesus. But the enduring symbol is that of the cross and Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, may I boast in nothing except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, a profound sense of humility and deep, overwhelming gratitude as we reflect on the cross. And that's what we're going to do here today. And uh, we'll be celebrating communion. It's interesting that Jesus gave two instructions to his disciples to make sure his legacy endures throughout time. And he said, you know, as often as you get together, you know, break the bread and drink the cup in remembrance of me. And we're gonna be celebrating communion today. And then on Easter Sunday, we're gonna be celebrating baptism. And you know, one of the powerful symbols of baptism is that it symbolizes when someone is immersed underwater, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's gonna be a really rich, powerful weekend uh, as we remember and uh, that keep Jesus at the very forefront um, of all that we're doing. And the good news is we get to do it together in community. I was so grateful. We had a prayer breakfast this morning and I thanked everyone. I said, you know, it's so great uh, that I'm not here by myself. And there was like 72 people who signed up and showed up and we had a wonderful prayer breakfast earlier today. And then as I look around the room, they were here to worship the Lord and encourage one another as we look to the Lord. So let's stand together and take a moment, say hello to a few people. Maybe there's some you don't even know yet, you haven't met, say hello to them, and then remain standing as we continue to worship. This is the reason for our faith is this weekend, and um, I just want to invite you to, as we ponder the cross today, just really reflect on what the cross means to you. Oh, the passion, oh, the mercy of our Savior God, um, the cross, what he mean, you mean to him is what um, is displayed on the cross. So just to take that in this morning, let's sing together. No quit. 
sent you to the cross and you chose that and you endured the cross Lord for 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 us Lord we just want to reflect again today just how much that sacrifice meant and, and, uh, yeah God would you just remind us today how much we are loved by you God we thank you and we praise you for everything that you've done for us we give this time to you Lord in Jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It was designed to punish. It was created to kill. It was meant to showcase earthly power on the side of a hill. It was wood and rope. It was hammer and nails. It was degradation, then death. And it never failed. It was chosen to stop the Christ, to erase the message he taught. It was the bitter end of Jesus. At least, that's what they thought. It was intended to defeat, to put down, to make the disciples give up, but instead it became the symbol of God's love. The icon of death became the icon of true living. What once marked the end is now the mark of the beginning, a mark of forgiveness, of new life, of new birth. What began at Calvary now covers the earth over cities, over hospitals, through the streets, through homes. The picture of God's sacrifice is our picture of hope, the lasting image of our Savior and salvation's great cost. This is more than a symbol. 
This is The Cross. The cross, the, the, this, this symbol, this, this cross, the scriptures say that the blood of Jesus, that, that, that the blood of Jesus was poured out for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of even my sins, the the forgiveness of, of your sins, every one of us. It, it all happened, this pouring out, it all happened on the cross. This Good Friday morning, and every Good Friday morning, we, we remember, we commemorate, even celebrate that which was accomplished on the cross. Uh, on the surface, if you think about it, it might seem kind of strange, hard to imagine where the, the good in Good Friday could even come from. See, it isn't good what happened on the cross. It's good what was ac accomplished through the cross. See, sometimes the, the good doesn't really reveal itself until it's buried, right? So sometimes the, the good doesn't really reveal itself until it's pushed down, covered over, covered. Think of, well, think of the tulip, right? Tulips don't always look pretty. But before the tulip blooms, before the... The tulip comes out of the ground, it, is, it appears to be dead. It is a little ball that, that we push into the ground that we cover over with dirt. And if that wasn't enough, we add water to make it muddy and, and gross and disgusting. I'm not a farmer, but man, that doesn't sound great. And you push it down and you wait. Yeah, you wait and you wait until something comes out of the ground until something powerful, something wonderful, something beautiful comes from something that was buried, that was dead, that was dirtied, that was nothing, that that was gone, that was pushed away, that was separated, but is beautiful. See, when we think of the cross, that's the, that's the kind of image that comes to, to my mind. See, we, we must acknowledge our part in the, in the process, uh, the pushing down, the, the separation, the dirty, the, after all, we've all sinned, right? Just watch the news or look in the mirror. If you don't know your sins, talk to me later. I'll point out a few, right? <laughs> But, but the scripture tells us that all have sinned, that none of us, not the guy at the front or even the guy at the back, none of us are without sin, that, that we've all fallen short of the perfect goodness of God. The scriptures say we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each and every one of us have turned to our own way. That's all sin is. Simply deciding to go our way instead of God's way. And we're pretty good at that, aren't we? We're, we're, we're all pretty good at deciding that we know what's best. And so we, we turn, we turn away from what we want to do, what we ought to do. And we go our way instead of God's way. And the scriptures teach us that God has laid on Jesus the dirt, the sin, the separation, the iniquity of us all. See, it's true, we were all part of the process of what happened 
on the cross. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the perfect goodness of God. And, and the results of those sin, the, what, what, what do we get for that sin? Well, we get death, this spiritual separation from the one true living God who longs to have relationship with us. And so between God's perfection, right? But between God's perfection and our sin, a bridge needed to be built. A, a bridge needed to be built, and the scriptures are quite clear, Jesus took on our sins, yours and mine, our sin, our shame, our, our separation. He, he took it all on so naturally every one of us might respond to Good Friday. We might respond to the cross even with, with guilt because we are in part, each of us, responsible and so it just makes good sense, right, to, to feel guilty, to feel bad. Or, or maybe we ought to respond to the cross and respond to Good Friday with, with grief. And focus in, not just on our guilt, but on the sad, sad, miserable state and the situation. To focus in on the dirt, the burial. Maybe we... We ought to, but, but you know, when it comes to grief, th this might surprise you. I, I don't believe that we ought to grieve the death of Jesus. Because, although Jesus died on that cross, he didn't stay dead on this side of the cross, on this side of history. We ought not glorify the wrong parts of this. See, we know how the story ends, and it doesn't end with the bloodshed. It doesn't even end with the burial. Good Friday is good because it's all about what was accomplished the forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation with a holy God who longs to have relationship with you, with, with me. Good Friday is about the opportunity for real relationship. And so it, it ends with something good, very Good. It ends with a ransom being paid, redemption made, and a relationship with the living God that never has to fade. The cross isn't what we glorify, but what was accomplished on the cross is beautiful. I remember my... My mom passing away, uh, it'd be about four years ago, just uh, a few days ago, the fourth anniversary of her passing. My dad passed away as well, but that one was more like 30 years ago. They were both believers. Uh, I, I know that they're both in their heavenly home. They got their new bodies, they are restored that they are, are with Jesus. In fact, scriptures tell us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so I don't begrudge them for a second their heavenly home. I, I don't wish for them to come back for them, and I don't even grieve for them. You might think I'm, I'm heartless, but if I grieve, I don't grieve for my mom, I don't grieve for my dad, I grieve for those who have been left behind. They're in a better place. They are dancing and having the time. They are doing what they were created to do. They are not missing out on something. They are in a 
in that better place, our heavenly home. They are home, right? And so I miss them. And I, I grieve for, for those who didn't get to spend much time with them. I grieve for those that, that didn't even get to, to know them. I, I, I grieve for those that, that wish they, they could have spent more time. I, I grieve for those who, who don't know where they are and how free and fantastic they are. See, we, we ought to grieve for one another. But we don't grieve for any believer who is with Jesus in heaven as though they were somehow missing out on something or living a lesser life. No. First Thessalonians 4.13 reminds us, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed so that... You do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. See, Jesus has set things up so differently for the believer. Jesus has set things so differently for the ones who understand. It's not the cross, but what was accomplished on the cross. And it's Jesus who invites us who asks us, who who calls us to remember what was done for us, what was poured out for us. He invites us to remember the broken body, the shed blood, not so we can grieve or even so that we can be overcome with guilt. He invites us to remember, to commemorate, to celebrate even so that we can understand, so that we can even receive the the good, the, the good news that as believers, we're forgiven, we're free, we have been purchased and paid for. You know, as a, as a little kid, I can't help but, but, but remember as, as a little boy being out with my friends, um, playing in the neighborhood, especially this time of the year when the, the light is, is staying out uh, a little bit later. And so I'd come home from school and then in the spring, I would often get new sneakers or uh, uh, and some new clothes. They were always a little lighter colored, which I don't know who was thinking about that. But I love to play outside. I love to get dirty. I love Tonka trucks. I, I love loved all that kind of stuff. And I can remember coming home from school and it'd be rainy and muddy. And I love to step in those puddles and drive. I'd build bridges. I would do all sorts of stuff. I had a good time in the mud. And then all over the neighborhood around five o'clock, everyone would hear a voice coming from my house. It was my mom. Kevin! Supper time! come home and all of a sudden I would snap out of whatever I was doing I'd I'd look at my new sneakers I'd look at my pants I'd look at my hands I'd look at the mud I'd look at the mess and and I think I can't go home and so I would hesitate I would hold back right I would I would try not to upset my mother but then all over the neighborhood And then other moms would start leaning out the window saying, Kevin, your mother's calling you. (laughs) And so I'd go home and I'd present myself. My dad, he never got real mad like he wasn't the the time. But but man, when I I knew I'd done something wrong when he looked at me and said, boys, oh boys, oh boys, (laughs) you're in trouble. My mom was more passionate about the anger. She sent me to the bathroom. She said, get yourself cleaned up. I'd come out of the bathroom. I'd sit down for supper. She'd do a little inspection, often send me back in to examine myself and to see what I'd done. And and, and then I'd, I'd come back out and we'd sit at the table, my older brother and my older sister, my mom and my dad, and, and we'd sit there and, and we'd hear about each other's days. 
We'd, we'd chat, we'd talk through things. I'd get a little bit of instruction. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be told some wonderful things and sometimes some terrible things. Uh, and, and, and I'd listen to my brother and my sister and we would, we would chat, we'd remember. We'd go through the, the process around the, the table. And what was happening at that table, especially as holidays would get closer and we'd gather around the table, what was happening at those, at those, those special times was much like what was happening the night before Jesus went to the cross. Jesus called on his disciples. Come! Okay, c- come on! In, in fact, he, he sent them out. Go, go make supper. Pre- prepare for the Passover. It's, it's time to come together. I, I, I'm wanting to do this. I'm wanting to sit with you. I'm wanting to eat with you. I'm wanting to do this together. And so the disciples go out and, and they, they follow his instructions. But, but in the same way as Jesus was inviting them to sit and to eat, to come together, do you realize this, that that Jesus Christ, the living God, is calling you and he's calling me by name. Inviting us to the table because there's, there's something that happens around the table. This community, this connection with the living God. He, he wants nothing more than to do relationship with us. And so I hope you understand as we sit in front of a cross, that that cross is an invitation, right? That that, that cross is a calling us home. It's calling us to the table. No need for guilt. And not not even a lot of need for for grief. But, But rather a need to recognize the good in the relationship we now have access to through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. There's a Jewish tradition I I love that when you go into a a Jewish home, especially years ago, but I understand that that some Jews would still practice this today, that they offer you some, some wine. And, and if they like you, if they, if they really like you, they, they fill that glass right up, right? And as a sign, as a tradition, as a, as a custom in Jewish homes, especially in Jesus' day, if you were really welcome and, and they wanted to show you hospitality, they would allow the, the wine to, to overflow. The psalmist said, my cup overflows. See, God wants that hospitality. He wants that closeness. He wants that connection. Not nearly enough or merely enough, more than enough. He wants that hospitality for each of us. And he allows, he allows it to overflow. He pours it out as a symbol, as a, as a sign that there's, there's more, that there's more than enough. He, he, wants, he wants you so much. He wants relationship with you so very much. See, there's good in coming home again. That there's good in washing up. That there's good in eating together, in drinking together, in, in remembering. God longs for relationship with you, with me, with every one of us. Luke 22 tells us of this this story where Jesus is sending out his disciples to prepare for the Passover. 
And so they go out, they follow the instructions, they prepare for the Passover supper. And when the hour comes, they're sitting together, Jesus and his apostles, they reclined at the table. The custom of the day was, was in, in the, the East, uh, in the Middle East, uh, to have a very low table. And they would lean on, on their left arm and they would eat with the other arm. They, they would sit around together. It, it wasn't just a, a little piece of bread and a, a little sample size of of drink, they ate together, they had supper together, they fellowshiped together, they told stories together, they got some instructions together, perhaps some correction, some affirmation. They ate together, they reclined at that low table. And Jesus says to the disciples as they've gathered around, for forget about the pictures that you have in your mind of, of what it was. And listen to what the word of God actually says. I, I have eagerly desired, Jesus said. I wanted this. I, I longed for this meal where we could come together, where we could eat this, this celebratory supper together. I longed for that. And then it took a turn. He got serious and it was like, you know what? We're all sitting around the table. This is all good. That's a funny joke, Kevin. This is funny. This is great. But I just got some one more thing my mom would say to tell you. And Jesus reclined at the table. He chatted. And he said, I, I wanted to be together so much. I wanted to eat this together so, so much with you before I suffer. Now, this would have been the first time. The, the, the disciples didn't know or understand how this whole thing was played out. See, we're on the other side of the cross. We're on the other side of history. And so much of this we can take for granted if we, if we just gloss over it. But Jesus said to those that were closest to him, I, I long to be with you and to, to do this with you before I suffer. And Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he, and he gave it to each of the disciples saying, this is my body. It's like when, when I sit at the table with my son and my wife, and I'm trying to explain to them what happened at the office today. So, like, I, I take the salt, and I take the, the, the pepper, and I say, so Jerry ran into Pastor Dave, and, and they were fighting like crazy. And then the salt is Jerry, and the pepper is Dave, and it was a wild, wild time. But I was sugary sweet. Here, let me pull the sugar out. And, and that, this is me, right? This is, this is me, sugar sugary sweet, you know? Well, well, Jesus takes the bread and he gives thanks and he breaks it. And he says, this is, this is like my body given for you. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When you eat this, remember Remember me. And in the same way, after supper, after they visited, after they, they spent time together, he takes the cup saying, this cup, the, this cup, well, what is in this cup? Well, it's, it's the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. See, for thousands of years, since the very beginning, since the law of Moses was enacted, sacrifices were continually made. Blood was spilled. Blood played this significant and I think odd role in Jewish covenants. But, but not only in Jewish covenants, in Jewish traditions, it was also, blood was also used for thousands of years by others as well as a, as a symbol of the seriousness of the covenant and the commitment that both parties were about to, to make. I often think of a covenant as being the exact same thing as a contract, but in Reality, uh, 
A covenant is a form of a contract, but, but also very different. See, with a contract being a, a legally binding agreement, if one of the parties violates or breaks the contract, well, then it's no longer valid. And although a covenant is a type of contract, catch this, check with a lawyer, in fact, that, that even if one of the parties breaks a covenant, it can remain intact even when it's breached. See, a covenant is a perpetual promise. A contract needs to be signed by both parties. But a covenant is sealed by one. See, the old covenant that we read about in the Old Testament, this first covenant was governed by a law that prescribed correct behavior. And the people continually broke it. Just like you and I would do. It contained a sacrificial system that only temporarily removed sin. And so the priests of the day who represented the people of Israel to God, well, they had to keep on performing blood sacrifices because the people couldn't enter God's presence themselves. So the priests play, pray, played the role of the middleman coming to God on behalf of the people. But, but, but now, now on this side of history, Jesus is saying to his disciples, everything is about to change. Something different is about to happen. Something new is coming. A new covenant is in my blood. And this new covenant is governed by a law that is internalized by the people of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. This Holy Spirit that is going to be for and in every believer, Jesus was explaining. And because of what was about to be accomplished on the cross of Calvary, our sins are now forgiven and removed once and for all. The writer of, yes, yeah. The writer of Hebrews explains it all this way. The law, this law of Moses, this first law, it's only a shadow, guys, of the good things that are coming. This isn't the reality of the good things. This is just a foreshadowing. It's just, it's just a taste. It's not the reality themselves. For, for this reason, this law of Moses, this law, these rules, these, these behavioral things, well, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year after year, make perfect those who draw near, those who want to come into the presence of God. This old law, keeping it, sacrificing it, it's never gonna work. Otherwise, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, would they not have stopped being offered? For, for the worshipers, those that wanted to be close to God would have been cleansed once and for all if these old sacrifices actually worked. And they would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. I guess if the sacrifice works... If the cleaning gets cleaned, if it's done, there's no need to feel guilty any longer once forgiveness, once the sacrifice has been sufficient. But, but those sacrifices, they're an annual reminder to the Jewish people, to the children of Israel of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats 
to actually take away sins. Day after day. Every priest stands and performs his religious duties in the middle between God and and man. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. I'm not making this up. This is what the Bible says. But when this priest that we're now talking about, when Jesus, the, the, the one between God and man, this priest, this high priest, this perfect priest, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, He waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. He's sitting back, just enjoying his kiddos, enjoying his forgiven children. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Their sins, he goes on to say, that the sin, my sins, our sins and our lawless acts, God says, I will remember no more. <laughs> now that's good. That, that is good. That is very good. And that's what we ought to remember, to commemorate and yet celebrate on this good Friday. The new covenant sacrifice of Jesus Christ sealed by his blood means that sins are forgiven once and for all. Amen. Yeah. But do you ever wonder, like I wonder, why all this blood talk? Scriptures say, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. I I wonder sometimes if this new covenant needed blood, needed death even, to be activated, to be enacted, kind of like a last will and testament if you think about it. See, many people would have a last will and testament sealed away, right? Not supposed to open that and be gawking at it all the time. It's sealed away. And it's not actually opened or enacted until death. And upon death, the seal is broken. The will is activated And the new instructions become the new reality. It usually happens after the burial. And then the inheritance, the the beauty, the, the new day is distributed. Upon the death of Jesus, something new happened. When Jesus said, it is finished, he wasn't just talking about the crucifixion or his earthly mission, but he was talking about the first covenant. The blood of Jesus says the first covenant is now fulfilled, finished. And the blood of Jesus enacted, activated this new day, this new Covenant, a perpetual promise for every believer. One sacrifice for all. One substitutionary sacrifice for all. One ultimate sacrifice for all. For me and for you. See, sometimes it's only when something is buried that its real power and beauty is fully revealed. Just look at the flowers. The beauty is not in the cross. The beauty is not in the burial. The beauty is in what was accomplished on that cross. 
the Apostle Paul wrote the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. We're going to distribute the elements in just a moment. And here's what I want to invite you to do as the scriptures would invite us to do. Examine yourself. Think about what you're coming to the table with. And as the elements come to you, we're doing this a little different, so you'll want to just pay close attention. The cups are actually stacked in the trays. And so when the tray comes to you, take a stack. There's bread on the bottom cup so that everybody doesn't have your fingers uh, or their fingers in your bread. There's bread on that bottom cup and the drink is on the top cup. Would you take just a stack of the cups and then hold on to it? The scriptures invite us to wait for one another, to examine ourselves. So if you'll take the elements, everyone is welcome to participate. You don't need to be a member of Hillside. You need to be a member of the family of God. And so if you've accepted Christ as your savior, no matter what your background or what your past is, today is your day to come to the table, to come close to Jesus. And before you receive the elements, I'll come back with some more instructions, but you go ahead and you uh, receive these and just spend a few moments examining things and thanking God for the forgiveness of sins. If you need uh, a gluten-free option, I know that Patsy, we've got a few people that will help with that. You can place your hand up and they'll make sure that you you get that. But I would just love it if you would take the uh, bread, take the drink, hold on to that. I'll come back in just a moment with a few instructions. You lead us in a time of worship. Just remain seated. i 
The Apostle Paul says that we ought to examine ourselves before we eat of this bread or drink of this cup for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak, are, are weak and, and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But, but we, if, if we had judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we bow before you just now. And we thank you for what was accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Thank you that even though every one of us have sinned and fallen short of your perfect goodness, oh God, that you have every desire for relationship with us. In fact, I thank you for that verse in Revelation that reminds us that you stand at the believer's heart's door and knock, looking for an invitation to, to come in and to, to eat, to fellowship with us, to do life together. All over this room and certainly at the front, we ask you first and foremost, oh God, as we remember what was accomplished, as we remember the shed blood, as we remember the broken body, oh God, we ask you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to forgive us for our sins. We receive your forgiveness. We receive you, oh God, and, and we just move you right into the very center of our lives. We repent, we turn from the wrong that we've done. We look to you, oh God, knowing that we could never be good enough, but you are God enough. And so, oh God, we depend on your goodness. We thank you that when you look at us, you don't see the dirt, you don't see the mess, you don't see the mistakes and the wrong choices, but instead you see us covered in the perfect blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And it is for that reason that we have this boldness to come into your very presence, to call you Abba, Father, Daddy, Forgiver, Friend. So, Lord Jesus, on this Good Friday, thank you for the good that was accomplished. Thank you for the broken body, the shed blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to uh, take the bread and let us eat together. Let us drink together. Now we have remembered, we have commemorated. Let us stand together and let us celebrate what was accomplished on the cross.
thank you again today, Lord, for the blood of your son that covered over every sin that we would ever do, every sin of the world, God. God, thank you for love. Thank you for your perfect love for us that was on full display on this day many years ago. God, would you go with us, help us to live in the hope that we have in Christ. For it's his name we pray, amen. All right, are you glad you came to church today? What a blessing, what an encouragement for the blood of Christ that was abundantly, abundantly poured out on our behalf. And can we thank Pastor Kevin for sharing that message today? It was really, really wonderful. It's a great, great way to launch us into, into this weekend and, um, and just to be filled with a re renewed sense of joy and gratitude and humility for what Christ has done for us. You know, I often remind people that it's not perfect people who get to go to heaven. It's forgiven people, right? And that's all of us because of what Christ has done. And so may his name be hallowed. Friends, thanks for coming today. I know we inevitably probably have some guests here for the very first time. We're thrilled that you're here. Please stop by our Connect Center in the lobby on the left-hand side, and our Connect team would love to give you a gift just to thank you for being with us uh, here today. Uh, we also know that life can be hard, and if you're uh, here today and, and would love someone to pray with you, man, our prayer team, they're going to be down here at the front. In fact, I want to invite them to make their way down to the front of the auditorium, and they're not going to rush out of here but they're here for you. And if you would like someone to pray with you today, pray for you today, uh, they're here and they would love to just lift you up before the Lord uh, in prayer as we're here as a community to encourage each other uh, in our journey of faith um, with the Lord. Want to invite you all back. You know, uh, it's Friday's good. Why? Because Sunday's coming. There's the rest of the story, right? Thank God for Easter Sunday. It's going to be some baptisms here. And... Um, and uh, incredible worship, praise choir, uh, message about Easter and all of that. And also just want to say that if you'd like to partner with us uh, through our Easter offering, uh, some of you maybe even, you know, in terms of an offering, want to give an offering today, you can use the giving boxes on your way out that are by the doors there, and many give online, but uh, whether today or an Easter Sunday sometime this weekend, love for you to partner with us in our Easter offering just to continue to, to be a church that shines the light of Christ into our community to give hope. So let's just pray now. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you you here today. May we leave with profoundly grateful hearts for all that you've done, Jesus. And everyone agreed together and said, amen. amen. Have a wonderful day.